Another week, time for more of your questions. People always ask us if we're doing this on a green screen. We're actually outside. I mean, this is just, we're in the nature. And you'll know because we are in the Mosquito Barrens this week. It's clearly a big hatching of like midges and mosquitoes. So over the course of this episode, you're probably gonna watch something eat my face. We're gonna show you a quick time lapse. So just more proof, more evidence that this is not a green screen, that we are actually in a forest. So if you wanna ask any, any questions, just go to any video or it's on the main channel and just type in your question. I will scoop them up, answer a bunch of my favorites here. All right, let's get started. Israel Gonzalez. How about if aliens do come and say, hey, we need a new planet for our species and determine the one next to you, Mars, is the one we're taking. We aliens won't bother you because it's currently uninhabited and there's no life, we are claiming it. How will we humans feel about our possible future home, away from home, be occupied by aliens? Will we start a war with the aliens? I don't actually have an answer for you, but I, I love the question because it is this, like we can't go to Mars right now, except maybe we can send some kind of explorers to Mars. But if aliens came and set up on Mars and built their bases and they weren't giving us any problems, but they kind of claimed Mars, even though Mars is in our solar system, I think people would freak right out. They would lose it and they would be, they would think that the aliens are going to, to invade, it's just another step. Even though it's a place that we can't get to, we kind of feel like it's ours. And that kind of territorial instinct is really fascinating. So this is one of those situations where I would love to hear your thoughts on this wonderful question. What do you think we would do? Would we be okay with it because we've already got the good planet Earth and they've got Mars? Or would we be really freaked out and like even go to war with the new Martians? So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Jonathan Livney. Can dark matter be explained by Dyson spheres? Dark matter is this invisible mass that's out there in the universe. We don't know what it is, but we know that it is there by the way that its gravity lenses light from further objects. So we can kind of map it out, even use it as a telescope, even though we don't really know what it is. Dyson spheres are the product of type two civilizations that have surrounded their star in some kind of swarm of satellites that collect all of the usable light. So making them invisible. So could a Dyson sphere explain what dark matter is? Well, no, because even if a, some kind of super civilization did surround a star with a Dyson swarm, they would be collecting the visible light from that star but then these uh, satellites would still be leaking infrared radiation out into space, and we would be able to detect the infrared radiation. And astronomers have actually done a survey looking for galaxies that are entirely in the infrared, what you would expect to see if they were completely colonized by a type three civilization. And they've looked here in our own Milky Way for type two civilizations, looking for Dyson spheres by that characteristic infrared signature. And so far we haven't seen it. So Dyson spheres would give off infrared. They wouldn't be invisible like dark matter. So dark matter is still just a big mystery. Andrew Anelor. Let's say we visit Enceladus and find that while its oceans harbors no life, it is potentially habitable by some forms of Earth-based life. Would it be ethical for us to introduce life there? Again, I love this question. These are some great questions. Now, and this is the, there is no one answer to this question. For me personally, I say yes. If it's just dead, and there's no life in there, and we're certain, which is a very difficult thing to do, then I think it's our kind of our job to take earth-based methanogens and put them down into the ocean and let them colonize around the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of Enceladus, that we can put life somewhere else in the solar system pretty easily. You, you know, I'm not sure exactly what would be involved, but you wouldn't have to make dramatic changes to the life forms, assuming it, it's just water with some salt in it and the, you know, the hydrothermic vents at the bottom of the, of the ocean. It feels to me like it's a thing we really should do because we don't know when we're gonna wipe ourselves out here on planet Earth and we don't know if anyone's gonna come next. So, but I, again, 
I would love to hear your thoughts about this. JM Autobot. Fraser, I'm a Patreon to you. Please answer my question. What will happen to the outer planets and moons when our sun balloons in a billion years or so? We hear so much about the inner planets getting eaten or not, but not the outer. Thanks. First, thanks for being a patron. That's awesome. For everyone else, go to patreon.com slash universe today. We don't exactly know what's going to happen when the sun goes into its red giant phase. As I said, the inner planets, we know Mercury, Venus, toast. Astronomers still argue about what's going to happen to, to Earth. Maybe it's going to get consumed, maybe it won't. Mars is probably safe, the rest of the planets are going to be safe. And as the sun expands into this red giant phase, the habitable zone of the solar system is going to expand outward. And you could absolutely see it expanding beyond the orbits of Jupiter and maybe Saturn, and it would melt those worlds. They would become water worlds orbiting around Jupiter. The problem is that the re this red giant phase isn't going to last for very long. So they might melt, and you might want to move there, and then the, and then the star is going to puff off its outer layers, and collapse to a white dwarf and everything's going to be really cold. But for a while, what is habitable in the solar system is going to dramatically change as the sun turns into a red giant. It's, it's a pretty cool idea. Rohan N. Does light that enters a black hole increase its mass? Because light has some energy, that energy has to go somewhere, right? That's exactly right. The amount of energy, as energy goes into a black hole, it just adds to the mass of the black hole. It's according to Einstein, E equals mc squared. So if you have energy in photons going in, according to Einstein's calculation, you know, mass, speed of light squared, you're going to get a certain amount of mass. You're not going to get very much as these photons go in, but given enough time. And one of the reasons why black holes aren't evaporating yet is because they're still receiving energy from the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is all around us in all directions, and is dropping photons into the black holes and making them increase in mass over time. And it's until into the distant, distant future that the background temperature of the universe is so low that they're not generating any more photons, or very, very few photons, that the black hole will finally be able to evaporate faster than it's accumulating radiation from the background of the universe. Kai Housen. Curious question I've been wondering for a while. Would guns be more effective on other worlds with lower gravity? Like, for example, could a decent sized pistol round hit with the velocity and force of a high powered rifle on, say, Mars? Just wondering. You're not going to get more velocity out of the gun. You're going to get a little bit because, for example, if you're on Mars and it has a lower air pressure, it's not going to get slowed down as it moves through the atmosphere as much. But, but, the, but what you're going to get is the guns are going to be more accurate over longer distances because the amount of gravity that's pulling the bullet down towards the Earth is lower. So a bullet is going to follow a straighter trajectory for a longer period of time. You're not going to get more force from the bullet, but you are going to get just more accuracy over long distances. So snipers will be really, really good. Lou Randier. I know that product placement is important, especially if you're sponsored by companies which require that from you to sponsor you at all. But to be honest, I hate Patreon listing in the middle of the program. I understand it may increase interest in paying. I have no stats. I don't know if it's possible, but I still hate it. Sorry. Well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, obviously. Uh, I think it's nice to hear about the names of the people that are supporting and it's our way to give back to our patrons who are supporting what we're doing every month. We have to sit down, and we write a tremendous amount, I write a tremendous amount, we're here in the forest, we shoot, chat edits, we do production work. It, it's, I mean, we pay out of pocket for people to do this work and it, we wouldn't be able to do it without the patrons. And so I really feel like it's important to, to help recognize them for the efforts and the money that they give to us. It means literally the world to us. Uh, I don't know, maybe go to your happy place while I'm reading out the names or skip forward. I think you can press the J and L keys. You can press the L key on YouTube and that'll skip you through when I start to introduce the patrons and that'll get you past that and back into the show. And I only take like, whatever, 10 seconds to do it. So that should be able to get you through. But I understand it's kind of like what we have to do in this modern world. That or lots of advertisements, pop-up ads everywhere. Brandon Stidham. Hi Fraser, another great video. 
do you think life of pure energy could exist? It's a big trope in sci-fi that biological life could eventually evolve into beings of pure energy by natural or artificial means. Doesn't the laws of physics outright ban this? I, I, I don't know. We understand the laws of physics as we do. And so if there was some kind of being of pure energy, it would have to still interact with the world in some way. It would have to store energy in some kind of chemical way. It would need to have some kind of physical matter. Uh, energy like photons, pure photons. I mean, that's really just energy, right? Electromagnetic radiation. It would need some physical form to be able to move back and forth. So, uh, yeah, as we understand the laws of physics. I mean, when you hear that kind of thing, it's sort of like trying to come up with a scientific explanation for ghosts or the spirit or transcending into some kind of greater plane of existence. And it's just science fiction. It's the same people that brought us teleportation and faster than light travel and artificial gravity. We should only listen to science fiction as far as we need to. And in this case, beings of pure energy, I don't really know how it would work. Three Dog 1963. Fraser, how did you schedule to see that satellite launch you went to last summer? Did you just find a schedule and show up, or do you have to reserve a spot? This was a very special rocket launch. This was the OSIRIS-REx launch. We knew it was happening. A bunch of my friends, journalists, organized that we were all going to go and see the launch. And because I'm a journalist, I get access to some pretty cool stuff. I can reach out to NASA and ask for press credentials to be able to go and see the launch. And that lets me see behind the scenes. We get to go up close to the rocket. We get to hear mission briefings from NASA and things like that. But for the vast majority of people, the easy way to do this is when you know there's a launch happening at Cape Canaveral, go to Cocoa Beach in Florida. And so it's on the coast. It's a little bit south of Cape Canaveral. And there's great hotels and there's this great beach and you can sit out on the beach and you can watch the rockets launch almost as nice a position as where we were out at NASA. You're not actually a lot closer because actually the distances out at Cape Canaveral are so huge. What I would recommend is do a search, do a Google search for upcoming rocket launches at Cape Canaveral. You'll see a bunch of dates. There's going to be a SpaceX launch this time. There'll be an Atlas V that time. There'll be the, the space launch system. And then go to Florida, get a hotel, or just you know get a hotel that's cheap and then go down to the beach at Cocoa Beach, look up into the sky and watch the rockets take off. And it shouldn't be that expensive and it shouldn't be that complicated to do. It's, it's a pretty easy, if, you got, if that's on your bucket list, that's a pretty easy thing to, to check off. And a bunch of people who are watching this right now, who live in Florida, have seen their share of rocket launches. It's a pretty common occurrence for them. And I should also say, if you live on the West Coast, you can go to Vandenberg, which is another great place to see rocket launches, and you can see it. I don't know the exact place to go, but you can see them from the West Coast. S. Cooper. Why do you always look so depressed each video? I don't know if I'm depressed. I, I, think, it's, I think I have resting serious face. <laughs> the reality is that I'm concentrating. Uh, and, there's so many moving parts to making these videos. It's kind of hard to, it, it, we've got the scripts and we've got the lighting, and we've got the camera and all the settings on the camera. We've got the audio and then we've got like trying to find a place and we've got the bugs. And it's, uh, it's very stressful to do this. It's fun and it's worth doing, but it is, um, my brain is always going like, how, what, am I doing this right? Is this work, is that gonna break? So it's, uh, so what you see as depression is just concentration. So here I am, clearly very happy. <laughs> uh, Michael Harmer. Is the total mass of the present day universe larger than the total mass of the universe? No, the total mass of the entire universe is exactly the same from shortly after the Big Bang to the present day universe. It's just that the density of that mass has been spread out over a larger area in the universe, but it's still the exact same amount of total mass. And in the far, far future of the universe, when the universe is gigantic and everything is dead and everything is spread apart and all the, all the atoms have 
you know, if, if protons will actually decay and they've turned into energy and all there is is just, and all the black holes have evaporated, it'll all still be the exact same mass as right at the beginning of the universe. Now the one thing that is coming into the universe is dark energy, which is this expansive force that's accelerating the expansion of the universe, but we don't know what it is, but uh, it's different than the mass of the universe, which is remained exactly the same and will always be the same. All right, that's it. Another uh, week, more questions. I really appreciate them. As always, wherever you're watching my videos, go ahead and put in your question. I will answer it here. Man, I feel these bugs chewing on me. All right.